Income tax 2023-2024. Business expenses, employees pay. Get ready and some coffee because we're setting our refund to the max with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, which you could find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov, tax year 2023. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income the sole proprietorship schedule c rolling into line one income of the formula the schedule c itself though basically being an income statement having business income minus business expenses which could be called business deductions resulting in in essence net business income which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to Line 1 income of the formula. The formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040, this being the first page of the Form 1040, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line number 8, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income part num number 1, additional income, Schedule C rolling in to line 3 business income or loss. This is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, where we have an income statement format, income minus expenses. We're focused down here on the expenses area, some expenses being more difficult than others. This time we're talking about the employee's pay. Now, as we think about employee's pay, we always have this kind of crossover that we have to think about ourselves and whether or not we are employees of the business. When we have a sole proprietor business, remember that we don't usually issue ursels in that case a W-2 form, and therefore we're not formally on like the payroll of the Schedule C type of business. However, we are kind of like an employee of the business in the sense that we still pay basically the equivalent of payroll taxes that being Social Security and Medicare. But instead of issuing ourselves W-2s to do that, we instead take the bottom line of the Schedule C, in essence, and calculate pretty much both the employee and employer portions of Social Security and Medicare on the Schedule SE self-employment. So we've talked about that in prior presentations, but we always have to touch on that when we get into the employees. So what about the employee pay then? The employee pay would be for those people that we have hired as employees, noting again and also that an employee is different from a contractor. So if we need help on our business, if we're growing, there's a couple ways that we can do that. One way is we could try to pull someone in as an equity partner. They can share in the revenues, in other words, but you have to give away some of the uh, decision-making power to do that oftentimes and typically you're going to have to restructure from a sole proprietorship to some other business entity format like a partnership because you're going to have to do at least allocation of the revenue in a partnership format possibly then creating an LLC or an S corporation or possibly a C corporation another thing that you could do is hire someone as an employee if you hire them as an employee, you have the control to be able to do what you want to do with your business and, and direct people more specifically. However, then of course you have to do with, deal with payroll and payroll is its own kind of thing. And 
Uh, it'll be similar in terms of rules for payroll in the United States for a sole proprietorship as well as any other kind of entity like an, an LLC and so on. One of the difficulties with payroll is usually just simply the bookkeeping of payroll and then the payroll taxes that you have to basically be keeping track of. And so for our side of things on taxes, for tax preparation, then questions we wanna make sure that we have in our mind. One, are we gonna be dealing with bookkeeping or do we wanna deal with just the data input on the tax side of things? How are we going to help clients that have questions about say payroll if they're picking up employees? What kind of network do we wanna to have together so that we have bookkeepers and possibly payroll professionals helping uh, clients out so that the books, when they come to us, we can of course do the data input. On the data input side of things then, if we have the payroll done properly, we should have everything we need to just take the information basically from the income statement and plug it into the system for the income statement side of things. If it's a Schedule C, that being the payroll expense and payroll taxes uh, side of things. Okay, so you can generally deduct on Schedule C the pay you give your employees for services they perform for your business. Now remember, that means they're employees. You, the other thing you could do is hire people as contractors. If they're contractors, you typically have less control over how they're gonna be doing their job. And you have to make sure that uh, basically we have the proper allocation so that if the IRS was to question us about whether or not this person is an employee or a contractor, we could show them that why we think that they're a contractor. In other words, the IRS is probably going to default to wanting people in an employee employer structure because then they can force you to do the withholdings, right? So in any case, the pay may be in cash, property, or services. So to be deductible, your employee's pay must be an ordinary and necessary expense, and you must pay or incur it in the tax year. In addition, the pay must beat, uh, meet both the following tests. The pay must be reasonable, and the pay must be for services performed. So this is the classic kind of setup that we can kind of understand how the IRS is gonna be structuring an income tax kind of system. Because remember, the idea of an income tax is that obviously anything that is income is basically taxable unless the IRS basically says otherwise. How does the IRS enforce that? They're gonna say on the payer side of things, that's where the IRS has leverage. In this case, if we're the employer, we are paying the employees. How does the IRS have leverage? Well, we want a deduction. We want a business expense. It's gonna be a big deduction. If the IRS sees that we have payroll expense or something, wages or something like that on our tax return, they would expect that we also filed, you know, the 941s, the 940 and issued the W2s and did uh, the, the withholdings. Uh, if we don't, that's where they have the leverage, right? Because if because we want the deduction and they're going to be able to see that those on uh, the tax return and therefore they want us to at least rat out the employees to make sure that if we're getting a tax benefit, they're getting hit with the taxes on their end uh, with the income side of things. Not only that, but if they're employees, they also want to make us into their, their tax collector. So we're required to do uh, the withholdings in that situation. Okay, so you cannot deduct your own salary or any personal withhold, uh, withdrawals you make from your business. So notice if you're a sole proprietorship, you will not typically pay yourself W-2 wages. Now that could seem unusual because that is different than other types of entities because the sole proprietorship is not kind of thought of as a separate legal entity, right? It's, it's going to be uh, just a business. We still keep the books separate but it's not like a separate legal entity. The C corporation, on the other hand, is typically considered a separate legal entity. It typically paying taxes on the corporate level, the owners of a C corporation being the shareholders, management of a C corporation, even top management like the CEO, usually treated as employees and therefore being issued W-2s, dealing with payroll taxes like Social Security and Medicare in a similar fashion as other types of employees. Whereas you will recall with the sole proprietorship schedule C, 
we don't issue ourselves a W-2, but rather still have to pay the Social Security and Medicare by taking the bottom line of the income statement, the Schedule C, and calculating Social Security and Medicare on uh, that uh, with, with the self-employment tax. That's the general idea. Now, when you look at the hybrid kind of entities like an S-corporation, which is trying to get the benefit of a corporation in terms of liability protection, as well as the benefits of a sole proprietorship, and that we have a flow through entity that doesn't have to deal with that double taxation as you do when you issue like dividends from a corporation uh, to the owners, then you still have to say, well, how are we going to deal with the payroll taxes? And typically like an S corporation might then have to issue ourselves as the owner, the, the W-2 so that we pay the payroll taxes. And that's where this reasonable wages comes in. Because the IRS, of course, thinks that all the money that goes to you should be subject to Social Security and Medicare. If you're an LLC, then the question is, do you issue yourself uh, wages as an employee or should it still flow through as self-employment tax? And then you calculate uh, the self-employment tax. So payroll basically is the same for different types of entities. The question often comes up, though, I mean, there's different aspects of it, but the general concept of it is pretty much the same no matter what type of entity. However, we have this issue of the owners and how, how, how is the owner going to be treated? And are they going to be paying their payroll taxes by issuing a W-2 or are they going to have self-employment tax for their calculation of Social Security and Medicare? All right, so as a sole proprietor, you are not an employee of the business. So kinds of pay, some of the ways you, you may provide pay to your employees are listed. So notice that when we're paying our employees, what we would like to do is pay the employees as much as we can uh, and, and have it as, as non-subject to taxes as possible because that means that we can pay them more. So if I pay the employees $10,000 and they have to pay $2,000 in taxes, that means in essence, I was only actually giving, able to give them value of, of 8,000 after taxes. The taxes aren't our fault but that's that's the purchasing power they have if we're able to give them ten thousand dollars that's not subject to taxes then we're giving them more benefit so as from an employee employer relationship it benefits both of us not just the employee right it benefits both of us if we could basically uh, have the income we give them not be subject to taxes. So you can imagine all these different kinds of ways you can think of doing that. Well, what if we give them, you know, awards or this or other kind of stuff? Well, usually the, the IRS is going to say anything you give your employees is going to be wages unless it qualifies as some kind of benefit. So, and obviously some of those big benefits that become important are things like a retirement plan, like a 401k plan or a SEP, uh, for example, because that's some money that you can give to them, which has a tax beneficial treatment. All right, so we have awards, uh, bonuses. Uh, so obviously a bonus is still gonna be pay, education expenses, fringe benefits. So we'll discuss uh, those later. So it, so those are areas where we might be able to, to, to have some tax benefits with the fringe benefits, possibly with some of the education expenses as well. So loans or advances, you do not uh, expect the employee to repay if they are for personal services actually performed. So if you, if you give out, obviously, if you give someone a loan and you expect it to be repaid, then it, you, you didn't give them, that's not wages. But if you give them a loan and you don't expect it to repay, be repaid, you can see how people would try to manipulate the system that way, right? I'm going to give you $10,000, but he owes it back to me later. And it's like, dude, they're never going to pay you back. Well, what, hap what really happened there? You gave them wages, right? right? You gave them wages and you just called it a loan, but it's never going to be paid back. So they're going to say that should be okay. So property you, you transfer to an employee as payment for services. So just because you don't give someone cash, the IRS is still going to say it's payment if you give them property or something else, right? Reimbursement for employee business expenses, uh, sick pay, and vacation pay. Okay, fringe benefits. So a fringe benefit is a form of pay for the performance of services. The following are examples of fringe benefits. 
benefits under qualified employee uh, benefit programs, meals and lodging, the use of a car, flights on airplanes, discounts on property or services. Employee benefit programs include the following, accident and health plans, uh, adoption assistance, cafeteria plans. Now these are types of things, we're not gonna get too deep into, into payroll uh, issues, but obviously payroll is gonna have tax implications uh, related to it. So again, any of these types of things that you can that you could do where you could possibly pay your employees while getting while giving them a tax benefit could be a beneficial thing to do right so so that would be the cafeteria plans dependent care assistance education assistance group term life insurance coverage welfare benefit funds so you can generally deduct the cost of fringe benefits you provide uh, on your Schedule C in whatever category the cost falls. For example, if you uh, allow an employee to use a car or other property you leased, deduct the cost of the lease as a rent or lease expense. So, right, so if you own the property, include your deduction for its cost or other basis as a section 179 deduction or a depreciation deduction. So you, the, the use of the car is being, is being expensed, right? So tip. So uh, you may be able to, uh, to exclude all or part of the fringe benefits you provide from your employee's wages. For more information about fringe benefits and exclusion of benefits, see publication 15B.